every time. How many of you are waiting for him to like, like stick his tongue out and eat a fly or something, right? <laughs> I, wish, I wish you could have been in the room uh, when uh, Pastor Scott said, this is the video that we have to introduce our series. He was so excited. <laughs> and he showed it to me and I was like, is this ever going to change? But it's so good. Because if you watched that video, you saw an animal that is designed to fit in. You saw an animal that was designed to blend into its environment, designed in that specific way to protect it from other things. And how many of you know, um, when you watch that, it gets your mind thinking about sometimes that's kind of who we are. Sometimes we become people that look just like that chameleon that try to blend in in our circumstances and in the environments we find ourselves in because we don't want to be noticed. We don't want people to see who we really are and we don't want people to actually see us wherever it is that we may find ourselves. And last week I had an opportunity to get away with my family. We uh, celebrated my mom's and my father-in-law's birthday and we were streaming online uh, together. And when this started to stream... Uh, we transitioned from our time of worship and the video came on and everybody in the room thought that we were actually, like that the TV had fallen asleep and that we were seeing, uh, we were actually seeing the screensavers that were on there and they started to freak out and they were like, Fi, Fi, what's going on? I said, no, 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 this is what we're actually talking about. <laughs> there is a purpose for this. It's about this animal that... If you listen, you will understand why it's such an important one to look at, especially in the times that we live in right now. Because, again, this whole idea of being a chameleon is about blending in and not standing out. But we believe here that God has actually called us to be people that stand out, not blend in with the crowd. Because when we blend in with the crowd, we end up looking like everybody else. And God has said, that's not the way that I've created you to be. I've created you to actually look and be a little bit different than everybody else around you. And there's a reason for that. There's a purpose for that. I remember as a, as a kid that um, I chose to play soccer when I was young, uh, probably about first or second grade. I chose soccer as my sport of choice um, because then and even now, I'm still too small for football. Uh, as much as I loved it, I was like, that wasn't going to be my sport. So I chose soccer. And after a while, in about fifth or sixth grade, I decided that I wasn't just going to play in the home recreational league, but I was actually going to try out for our uh, city's traveling league. And many of you know that when you go to a traveling league, it actually requires a little bit more of you when you go to step into that traveling. It requires you uh, paying a little bit more money, number one. But it also requires a lot more practice time, and it requires tournaments, and it requires going to places that aren't just get up in the morning and you can go right down the street to play at the local field, but you got to go to cities that sometimes you've never even heard of. And I remember when I decided that I was going to go try out for this soccer team that I realized that really quickly that it was going to be a lot more competitive and I was going to have to work hard to try to make this team. And I, would, I remember that first week of tryouts as I was in the, those tryouts working hard and doing my best to stand out because that was the only way that I was going to make the team. And at the end of the week, remember sitting by this phone right here, you know, the one that you had to wait 10 minutes before the phone would actually dial because it had to come all the way back around. <laughs> sitting by that phone because I was so excited to wait for that call from my coach telling me whether or not I had made the team. And I knew I made the team because, you know, I worked hard. And I remember getting the call and coach saying, hey, I'm, I'm excited to let you know that uh, you're going to be part of this team and we're going to have you and here's the practice dates and here's the tournaments and here's all the things that are going to be entailed in this new team that you were a part of. And I was so, so excited to receive that call. And I remember going through the season and then remembering that a couple of years later that because every year you had to try out for the team, it wasn't that you were on the team once and you were forever on the team. You had to continue to try out. And I remember one year going to try out and the same coach that had chosen me a couple of years ago was the same coach that would follow us as we would progress in age. And he 
called me at the end of the week, and I was sitting by the phone just, you know, at this point it wasn't as exciting because I was like, I'm on the team. But sitting by the phone and picking up the phone and remember hearing Coach who um, would call me son because I spent more time at his house than even his kids did. And he would say, son, I don't know how to tell you this, but you didn't make the team this year. And I remember being in, uh, it was about... uh, eighth or ninth grade, and I remember being crushed because I hadn't made the team, and I I didn't, my identity was kind of wrapped up in this team that I had become a part of, and I was so upset that I wasn't part of the team, and I was like, what am I going to do now? And so I found myself on another team and trying to fit in and be part of that team, and I said, you know what, I'm going to prove them wrong, and next year I'm going to make it. And not only am I going to make it, but I'm going to be a star. And so I gave everything I had. And I remember the next year sitting by the phone and coach calling me back up and him being excited, he said, this year you made it. He said, you've been chosen for the team. And I remember showing up to practice and being part of that team, knowing I was a part of it, but not knowing how I actually fit on the team. Because that team for that year that I was away was still together and they had still grown and they had grown without me and they were introducing me back onto this team and said, hey, you're part of this team now but not knowing how to actually act like I was part of that team. Because for such a long time, I was part of a different team. And I was going through practices, and coach would look at me, and he would say, son, just be you. Just stand out the way that you, are, that you know how to. Give your best. That's how you're going to fit in. That's how you're going to be part of this team. Because there was something about knowing that I had been chosen for the team, but there was something different about actually acting like I was on the team. And I believe that this is true not just about that soccer experience that I had, and maybe you've experienced something similar, whether it's for yourself or maybe it was your kids, that were, they were waiting on the, on, by, the, by the phone, waiting to be let know that they had been chosen to be part of this team, and you were excited. You bought all the gear because you were going to be the biggest fan. They were going to know that your kid had made the team, and you would walk around town with that with that logo on your chest being like, yeah, my kid's part of that team. But you would be excited. But here's the thing is that there's something quite different about knowing that you've been chosen for something and actually acting like you have been chosen. Because you can know something and not act like it. I remember um, one of my very best friends for years and years and years had tried to become a firefighter. And for so many different reasons was turned away for whatever it might have been. But I remember him receiving a call that he was finally chosen to be part of a team. He was finally chosen to be part of this group of people. And I remember going to him being pinned and him being excited about being pinned to be part of this firefighting team. And what was amazing is that as I was there, before they even pinned him, they had to put on this demonstration to let us know that they had actually trained and knew what they were doing. They were cutting buildings apart. They were pulling dummies out of burning buildings. They were putting fires out, doing CPR. And I was like, this is awesome. But I remember that he was demonstrating in that moment that he didn't not only know he was chosen, but he knew how to act like he was chosen. Can you imagine a firefighter knowing that they've been chosen to be a firefighter, but actually getting to a fire and being like, I don't know what to do. That wouldn't be good for you. That wouldn't be good for them. Because there's something that happens when you change from being just a person that knows that you've been chosen to being somebody that acts like they've been chosen. Maybe it was a job that you have been given or been offered that when you knew that you were part of that new team that you were going to go, when you stepped foot in the building for the first time, you weren't sure exactly how to act, but over time you learned. You learned what it meant to be part of that team. And I believe that the same is true about the way it is in God's kingdom is that you come from a place where we begin to know that God has chosen us But it's not good enough just to know that he has been chosen, that we've been chosen. We have to actually walk like we've been chosen. We have to actually act like we've been chosen. 
Because for a lot of us, a lot of times we receive that knowledge that we've been chosen and we receive the fact that God has chosen us and that we have been accepted into his kingdom and then all of a sudden we sit down and we get comfortable because we like to be comfortable. We like to sit in our chairs and we like to look like we know that we've been chosen. But when it comes time to actually acting like we've been chosen, that's a whole different story. But God has called us not to sit in chairs, but he's called us to actually walk like we've been chosen, act like we've been people that have been set apart. There's this passage of scripture this morning that I want to share with you. Peter was writing to a group of Christians that have been experiencing some persecution. Here's Peter, this man who had walked with Jesus, who had failed Jesus time and time again, to the point that one, at one point Jesus would even tell him, Get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine your best friend telling you that you're Satan and to get behind him? And that's what Jesus tells Peter because he had failed or was going to fail at one moment. And yet here is Peter who, after all of those failings, Jesus brings him back into the fold and says, No, you're going to be a leader. But I need you to not just know you're a leader. I need you to actually act like a leader. And he goes and he preaches messages and many people come to know who Jesus is because of Peter's words and eventually he would go to a place and he would write a letter. And he'd write this letter and here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2 to a group of people experiencing persecution because of their faith in Jesus. He says this in verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And we could stop there and be good, but he continues. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you received mercy. You're a chosen people. Peter is saying, look, in the middle of all the stuff that you're going through, in the middle of trying to fit in in your circumstances and in your environments, you're chosen. But he doesn't just stop at the fact that you're chosen. He gives adjectives of what it means to be chosen. And he says, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. But can you imagine these words that are spoken? You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You're a God's special possession. For someone in the church, that might make sense, but when you hear those words, you're kind of like, royal priesthood. They're not just words that just kind of roll off of our, our lips very easily, because those aren't words that we, that we speak often. You don't go up to somebody and walk up to them and say, hi, my name is Phi, I'm a royal priest. <laughs> because if you did, they might look at you some type of way, right? You, you don't go up to somebody and say, hey... I'm part of a holy nation. I'm God's special possession. They might say, I bet you are. I bet you are. But see, these words that Peter speaks, they're words that make sense to his original audience, but they aren't words that are so easily translated to us. Because, again, royal priesthood isn't just part of, it's just not part of our everyday vocabulary. But if we were to actually understand what Peter is saying to this chosen group of people, and in reality he's telling us that we are a chosen people, if we were to actually understand what he was actually saying, it might change a little bit of, of something about us. And so he's using imagery and he's using words that would describe something that this group of people would understand. He's using words and he's using imagery that these people would understand were titles and were things that were used in the Old Testament. And they were words and they were titles that meant something to these people, but if they don't mean anything to us, we can say it all the time, but it might not make a difference in the way that we actually live. So we have to actually go back and look at what is he actually saying. And I believe in Exodus chapter 19, you'll find exactly what it is that he's talking about. If Before we read this passage of Scripture, you have to understand that in the Exodus, what God was doing was he was helping get his people, Israel, out of Egypt. They had been living there in oppression. They had been living there in slavery. 
But God was doing much more than just freeing them from their oppression and their slavery. He was actually pulling them out to found a nation of people. Somebody that had been set apart. He was pulling these people out in order to use them and choose to show the world all around that this was his people. That this was his special possession. And because these were his people, he was actually going to use them to bless everybody around. And so God pulls these people out and they're getting ready to go and receive the Ten Commandments. And right before they receive that, they're in the wilderness. And here's what God says in Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 3. It says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And watch this. He says, if you obey me fully and you keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. And although the whole earth is mine, I've chosen you. Because you are going to be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. See, what you have to understand is that when God brought Israel out, he was trying to found a new nation. A new nation that was different than all of the nations that were around them. A nation that was going to make God their king. A nation that was going to receive all that God had spoken and say, this is the way that we're going to live and we're not going to look like everybody else, but we're going to receive God's blessing. And not only are we going to receive God's blessing, but we are going to be the instrument through which God is going to bless everybody around us. Why? Because we are a nation of royal priests. We are a holy nation. We are God's special possession, and we are going to stand out and live in that way by following God's commandments. And when we do that, God is not only going to bless us, but he's going to cause us to be a blessing to others. And they understood that they were going to take on this role of a priesthood. And what is it that a priest would do? But a priest was somebody that was a mediator between God and humanity. The priest was the one that went in and made atonement and made sacrifices until Jesus came. And they were the one that offered sacrifices for the sin of the people so that there would be able to be forgiveness and the people could live another year in God's forgiveness. And so when, he, when Peter is speaking to these people and he's saying, you are going to be a royal priesthood, what in reality he is saying is you are going to fulfill the role that just like those priests way back when filled. When they act as mediators between God and humanity, you now, that is what you have been called to do. You are chosen to be set apart to be a blessing to other people. God is going to bless you so you can bless others so that you can mediate between them so that they can know that they have a place at God's table. My role, your role as a chosen person of God is not to stand up and say, I'm chosen. Mm Mm-hmm. And try to stand above people. My role is to say I am chosen to bring you into the kingdom because you have a place here. But unfortunately, a lot of times we actually act that way. We say, I am chosen. I have been chosen. And because I've been chosen, I'm actually going to, you know, I'm I'm going to hold that right here. I'm going to put myself above you. Because I'm I'm God's special possession. I'm God's people. And instead of acting like the priest did back then, we actually act in a way that repels people away from God's table. Because instead of allowing God to bless us to bless others, we allow God to bless us and hold on to it and say, I'm just going to know, and that's good enough. But as God's chosen people, you have not been called and chosen to just be called and sit, but you have been called to receive and go. See, when Jesus was commanding his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations, he wasn't just telling them, come in and come to Bible study and sit down for a minute and hang out and just sit there. But he was saying, come away. Learn, receive what it is that I'm trying to tell you. And then when you have received it, go and bring others in. 
Don't just receive and sit. Because if you receive and sit, you're missing the purpose of being chosen. Because you have been chosen not just to receive and sit, but you've been chosen to receive and go. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And so now when you understand what it means to be a royal priesthood, you don't just receive something and just hold on to it, but you receive it and let it go. And you receive it and you bring people in. Because it's not enough just to receive, but you have to actually give out. You have to actually give what it is that God has given you. And so you say, well, that's wonderful and that's great and, you know, that's it's cool that I've been chosen. And it's cool that I'm a royal priest and that God has chosen me to be someone that's going to, you know, help others come in. That, 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 that's great. But remember, there's one thing about being chosen is that there's... There's more than just knowledge. There's an acting out and a living out that has to happen. Because it's one thing to know and it's quite something different to act. Dr. Darius Daniels, he's a pastor out on the East Coast, pastor of Change Church, he said this, you can't be different and not be different. Like, you kind of got that. He said, you can't say that you're different You can't say, I'm a royal priest, which you might not say anyways. But you can't say that that's what it is that you are and not actually act like you are. You can't say, I'm a royal priest and say, I'm going to just be like everybody else. And in the context of what we're talking about, you can't just walk around saying you're chosen and not act like you're chosen. Because so many of us, we receive the fact that we're chosen, but then we kind of stop and say good it's wonderful God is great and so you might be asking yourself then well how in the world am I supposed to act like I'm chosen because there is a there is something that you're supposed to do there is some way that you are actually supposed to walk out this chosen life that I believe that Paul actually pointed out exactly what that looks like in his letter to the Colossians and what you got to understand is this is that whenever these writers of, of of these New Testament books and and, and uh, the Gospels, when they were writing, they were writing to actually combat something that was going on in that church that they were writing to. Usually they were writing to combat some type of heresy or something that was happening. And he writes this letter to a Colossian church that is dealing with this idea that they've been chosen. And they've been chosen by God. And Jesus has commissioned them. But they've kind of reverted back to their old ways and saying, ah, Jesus is just kind of... He, he's cool, but he's not this one that we thought he was. And so Paul is writing to this group of, of, of people, and he's saying, I need you to remember that you've been chosen by God and who God is, number one. But not only do I need you to know who God is, but I need you to start acting like you know who God is. Because when you've reverted backwards, what you've done is you've given people a false picture of who God really is. And that's not what you were chosen for. And so he says, watch this. Let me tell you, as a Christian, as somebody that's supposed to follow after Jesus, this is what they're supposed to look like. And he says this in Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 12. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, there's that word again, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. So not only now are you a royal priesthood and a holy nation, but you are dearly loved. He says, clothe yourselves with compassion with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then he goes on and says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And if that wasn't good enough, he said, will you just be thankful? Be thankful and let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, with arms lifted up, not with hands in your pocket, but excited for what God has done inside of you. He didn't say that, but 
He didn't say that, but you know what I'm saying. And then he says this, and whatever you do, whatever, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If we are to live and act like God's chosen people, then we need to be people of compassion, people of humility, people of patience, people of peace. This is who we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be just people that are like, "Mm mm-hmm, I'm chosen. I know it. But we're supposed to be people that actually walk this out. We're supposed to be people that walk in forgiveness. That walk in patience. That walk in peace. That walk in gratitude. And it's not just towards the people that are sitting next to you. But it's towards everybody. See, because living a chosen life, it's a choice. You get to choose to act like you're chosen. Because you can know that you're chosen and still act a mess. You can know that you're chosen and act like it hasn't made a difference in the world in your life. You can know that you're chosen and actually act like you were a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. See, but here's the problem. Most of us know that we've been chosen. And most of us, oftentimes, when we step foot in a church building, we act like we're chosen. Or in our connect groups, we act like we're chosen. Or when we're meeting with a brother or sister, we can act like we're chosen. But get us behind a computer screen. And we act like we're a royal priesthood of ourselves, not the God who came to redeem us and restore us. Get us into a workplace when somebody rubs us the wrong way and that patience and that forgiveness and that gentleness goes out the window. But God has not called us to just be a royal priesthood and a holy nation when we step foot in a church building, but he has called us to be that every single place that we go. But unfortunately, a lot of us, we receive that word and we only act on that when we're in holy places. I don't know if you, if you read with me just a little bit ago, but God said that the world is mine. So everywhere you go is holy. And if the world is mine and if everywhere you go is holy, then you're supposed to act like you're holy in a royal priest at every single place that you step foot. But for some of us, knowledge is good enough. But I believe that we've been chosen to step out and to stand out and not blend in. We're not to be chameleons. We're to be people that are to stand out, that people would receive and know that they're welcome. Why? Because we have extended what we have received to them by the way that we walk and we live every single day of our life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if we began to be a people that began to exhibit patience with one another? When you sit in the drive-thru for 15 minutes for a sandwich that should have taken about five minutes to make, that people still see Jesus in you. Can you imagine if with your significant other you actually started to speak with gentleness instead of criticism? Can you imagine with your children if you began to speak to them gently and correcting them and admonishing them in the way of God instead of hammering them? Can you imagine if you had a peace in your heart? Can you imagine if you lived a life that was grateful? I don't deserve what I have. I don't deserve to have people like I have in my life. But I am grateful for them because they push me. They show me that there is so much more that God has for us. 
Can you imagine, just for a moment, can you imagine what your life would be like if you began to let go of the people, of the offenses that people have laid on you and began to forgive them? Not because you all of a sudden checked a box that say that they're worthy of your forgiveness, but because you've forgiven them the way that the Lord has forgiven you. Can you imagine if we began to walk like we were chosen and not just know that we were chosen? Can you imagine if we began to be the royal priesthood we have actually been called to be? What a difference that would make to a watching world that is looking for not perfect people, but people that actually don't just say they're different, but act like they're different. Can you imagine if we stopped just knowing we were chosen and actually acted like we were chosen? Can you imagine what this world around us would begin to look like if God's people actually started to stand out instead of blending in? Can you imagine if we began to walk in these very things that we have been called to walk in so that we could be the blessing to all of the people around us and let them know they're welcome at God's table? I think what would happen is that we would begin to see people say, oh, they don't just say they're different. They actually are different. They don't just say they're chosen. They actually act like they're chosen. They don't just receive forgiveness, they give forgiveness. They don't just ask for patience, they actually act in patience. They don't, they don't just pretend to have peace, they actually have peace. See, because you cannot say you're different and not be different. And I believe that God has called us to not just say we're chosen, but to act like we're chosen. Because there's quite a difference between knowing you're on the team and acting like you're on the team. Peter told us, you're chosen. It's you. When you, open that, when you open that passage, he's not just talking to a group of people then, he's talking to you. You are chosen. I am chosen. We are chosen. Let's begin to act like it. And so as we close in prayer this morning, I got to ask you this, this final question is this is, Paul told us, he gave us a list, patience, humility, peace, gratitude. He gave us all of these different things. Gentleness, is there one of those things that you struggle with? Is there one of those things that you could say, if I began to work on this area of my life, if I allowed the Holy Spirit access to that spot in my life, that it would make all of the difference in the world. But here's what I do know, that the moment that I think that I've got one of those things right, I realize that I've got another one to work on over here. So it's not just, I'm going to work on this and I'm done. It's I'm going to work on this and I'm going to go back and work on this because I'm constantly got to choose. I've constantly got to choose to allow God to work in my heart because otherwise I'm just going to blend in like everybody else. But God has called me to stand out. So what is that thing? Is it, is it gentleness in the way that you speak to people? Is it humility? Is it a peace in your heart? What is that thing? Is there someone that you need to forgive? And not just forgive like, yeah, I forgive you actually allow that forgiveness that you have received to penetrate your heart so that you can really forgive people. What is that thing? And as we go to prayer, would you allow the Holy Spirit to show you what that is so that in this week to come that you don't just know about it, but you work on it and act like you have been chosen. And so let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, First and foremost, thank you for Jesus. That because of Jesus, we have been forgiven. We have the ability to be set free. But God, as we come to you this morning and as we, as we open our hearts to you, Holy Spirit, 
If there's something in our lives that is causing us to only know that we've been chosen and isn't allowing us to act like we've been chosen, we pray that you would open that to us. That you would help us to work at that thing and to grant you access to that space so that you can transform us so that we wouldn't be people that blend in, that we would be people that stand out. That we would actually be the royal priesthood that you have called us to be. That we would be people that would be blessed, not just to hold on to the blessing, but to bless others. And God, we pray if it's gentleness, would you help us to speak more gentle? God, if it's gratitude, would you help us to be grateful? God, if it's peace, would you let us know that you grant a peace that is beyond all understanding? God, if it's humility, would you remind us who we are? Lord, we don't want to just be people that say that we're different and not act like it. God, we don't want to say that we are people that are chosen and not act like it. God, would you help us to actually say it and be it? God, would you transform us so that we would be not just people that would come in and receive and sit and hold on to, but that we would be people that would come in and receive and go out and bring others in. Use us, God. Use us to let others know that you love them, that you welcome them, just as you have welcomed us. God, we don't want to be people that blend in but we want to be the chosen people that you have called to stand out from this point forward. Holy Spirit, help us, guide us, lead us, equip us to be that type of people we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.